I like to start this off appropriately. Um, let's make sure we give Dave the proper acknowledgement and the Zydor staff. Um, and the reason I, I'm so adamant about this is because uh, I'm a mycophile. I'm a mycologist. I'm not a dealer. It's very distinct. And this times, we're seeing an onslaught of dealers. Their whole thing is chasing the bag and giving people stuff. And what we're dealing with is open heart and brain surgery. And you don't give someone a scalpel and a surgery manual and say, go home, practice. And so I, I really respect Dave because so many people in this realm are so uh, driven through capital that they don't understand the importance of this work that we're doing and the lasting impact of this work. And so to see someone who really dedicates real time resources you know, to making sure that uh, the community is informed. And as we expand this world, um, that there are people well informed that can share with their families, you know, I, um, I have to acknowledge them. Uh, before Kalindi passed, um, me and him would spend many times, many miles going around presenting, sharing, learning. Uh, and um, quite often it was just a love, a work of love where we would come out our own pockets and it was never a question of capital is a question of purpose. Um, and I've seen many times before me, before I even knew about it, Kalindi would spend thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds of hours financing his own travels to support people in this space. Um, and, and to Dave's credit, Dave was one of the first people to really acknowledge and accept Kalindi. There would be times where we would go to international conferences and they would regulate Kalindi to the last day, the last hour, in the lowest corner of the room, and then not even give him honorarium. But it was deeper than ego for him because it was about getting the information out and learning. Um, of course, it affects anyone who works hard and doesn't get proper acknowledgement. And um, it was a beautiful thing that in his latter years, before he made his transition, Dave stepped up in a major way and said, no, you deserve to be treated like any other speaker. So when he came out, he was given a place to sleep, right? <laughs> and an honorarium and things like that, and proper due for the work he's done. Kalindi, uh, my teacher, my Baba, has been about this work for over 50 years. Um, and I, come up, I came up under him as a understudy. So my name is Baba Mudu Mbaki. Um, to, my presentation is Walking the Path of Initiatory Practice. It's very broad. I truncated it. I shortened it down because it's so much information. And my main focus is to share out how Kalindi impacted me and some of the work that um, I'm about and that we hopefully all are about moving forward. Um, I'm going to start off with a, a story from the dream time. Um, there existed a civilization in ancient times that, that lived in a world that was far different from ours. Their world was based on water. And this was a time in which this civilization, understanding and orientation with the universe was based on water. Their concept of the divine was based on water. Their symbol of the divine was based on water. For food, they had aquaponic gardens that extended thousands of acres through the ocean and the rivers and the lakes in which they would cultivate. The farmers would dive deep and cultivate animals from the deep and also purposely plant things. And so their entire diet was based on aquatic animals and species. The region also had textiles that were based on things like seaweed, kelp. Everything was based on water-based plants and animals. In fact, their entire Scientology, or their scientific, not Scientology, but their scientific uh, chases was based on water to the extent that they had refined water, um, the ability to transmit information in the water and teach people simply by drinking it. The ability, just like we transmit power through electrical conductive conductivity, they were able to transmit thoughts through the use of water technology. Even on the military level, they were able to find ways to protect and defend themselves utilizing water power as opposed to fire power. It was a very advanced civilization. And they thrived. 
And part of their cultural uh, tradition was making sure that the youth, of course, were brought up in the ways of their people. In other words, the youth, because these people were water-based, were born out of the womb with gills. You know, they had webbing on their hands and webbing on their fingers. And the adult's job was to teach them the ways of the water, how to dive deep and stay underwater for 20 hours, how to uh, predict off reading the waves, what the weather was going to be, how to smell the changing currents of the ocean to predict the temperature of the water and smell the actual fish which were in the areas in advanced society. And like all advanced societies, there existed elders and wise people in ancient writings. Now, the ancient elders understood that in this universe, there were four basic elements, of course, earth, water, fire, and uh, water. But they, because they were water-based, they focused mostly on the water. And fire, earth, air was considered esoteric because it just wasn't relevant. But the elders knew about it. And the elders also knew that the universe was about balance and that eventually these elements will come back into balance and that this water in which they created the entire civilization and worldview based off of would eventually recede and get dry. But this was not something that was foreseeable. It was not worth causing alarm in population, but it was worth taking note of. And so these elders in their wisdom began to create an educational system. They began to etch their lessons of water into stone to make sure that these lessons maintained. And they made sure that the youth would attend these classes to understand the sacred aspect of water and how to approach water and how to deal with the water, the atmosphere, and to utilize it properly and to understand their spiritual connection to water and the universe and such to the extent that this was just normal, just like today we send our youth to become educated in the ways of our culture and our world. And so, like all civilizations, as it became older and older, people began to doubt and question the value of these water teachings. And people began to forget the ancient ways and the ancient traditions. Now, while this was going on simultaneous, the water fall and the water amount was shrinking. But because they were poor custodians of their history, they weren't taking note of the dropping water levels until eventually someone discovered, wait a minute, this is not the reality our ancestors lived. And in fact, we are losing water. In fact, our very orientation with reality itself is about to change because we only know our orientation with this one element, water. So more than ever, the elders knew it was important to build these schools and make sure the youth learn the science of water because this was a dying element and they needed to preserve their history and their culture. And they did it as best they could. As the water receded, however, knowledge receded. Knowledge of how to build a boat became ragged and such. They didn't understand the purpose of an oar. And suddenly they felt it was OK to have gaps between the boards of a boat because they forgot the science of water and hydrology. The farmers forgot the science of aquaponics. And so they began to just simply, you know, skim seaweed off the surface of the ocean and throw a rod in the water and pull fish out like we do today. And they began to learn, forget all of these ancient techniques, but the children would still go to school. And so when you would go to these institutions, you would find rows of children laying on boards doing this with their instructor, being very disciplined about them properly applying the freestyle and the breaststroke with their instructor demanding that they hold their breath for longer and longer. Of course, the youth said, this is irrelevant. It's not even the water around. It's not even the days of ancient. Why we learn this ancient nonsense? I understand the importance of culture and tradition, but it's not like that anymore. So the traditions faded. The knowledge of water faded. And so in fear of what happened or what would occur, they began to build gates around their civilization because they knew land-dwelling animals would eventually come and attack, and they put guards into towers. And like every generation, there are those who are seeking wisdom of the ancients. There were small groups of people who studied these ancient etchings and understood that we are a water-based civilization. And they even went further and realized the prophecy indicated that water will come back one day. And so these students were absolutely astute at learning how to swim, how to build boats, how to construct fishing rods, how to do aquaponics, how to study the depths, understanding ocean currents, understanding clouds and such, because they knew that one day this knowledge would be valuable, while the rest of society said it was nonsense. And so as things deteriorated, the descendants of these wise students began to have prophetic dreams that beyond these gates 
which were protecting them from land dwelling animals, there existed a reality that the ancients knew of. And so an intrepid amount, a intrepid group, one, two, three of them decided to venture beyond the gates, risking life, limb, and happiness. And as they began to traverse this area, the guards would shoot at them and try to keep them from moving the gate, but they would evade every time and they would walk through this desert dunes looking, trying to find relics and artifacts of their ancestors, and they would come back, and they would go out and come back. And then one day, one of the more intrepid of the three got up in the middle of the night while it was still cool enough to walk far distance in the desert, and what he stumbled upon was this giant, huge oasis. In fact, it wasn't an oasis. That's all that he knew, but it was an actual entire archipelago of water, similar to how their ancestors had it. And that night, he swam in the water. He enjoyed it. The little he knew about water, so excited he swam the whole night. He got up in the morning, walking back to camp. The sun began to bleed down on him. And by the time he got back to his camp with his comrades, he was bone dry. And here he is telling his comrades about this wonderful place that existed, that was full of water, that existed just as the ancestors believed. And they said, but you're dry. What are you talking about? He said, no, I promise. Last night, <laughs> I was in the water. I was swimming amongst the fish. I was enjoying the, the water. They said, whatever, you're dry. They say, I promise you, tonight we're going to go on this journey. So the three got up that night, went on a journey, experienced water. They were overjoyed. They had found the source of their civilizational key, and they decided that we're going to go back and we're going to show everyone. So they gathered wicker baskets, gathered as much water as they can. After taking the final dip, they began to walk back across the desert. As soon as they get back across the desert, they come across the guards. The guards say, where are you coming from? They said, we're coming from where water exists. The guards immediately attempted to arrest them. They evaded them. They ran back to the city center and said, we found water. Everyone gathered around and said, where'd you find water? They say, we have water right here. It had evaporated. They say, no, we were swimming, fill our shirts. But they were dry. No one believed these guys. So eventually, they went back every night to experience this, but they realized that wasn't good enough because if everyone in that civilization wasn't aware of the science of water and how to properly use it, they would be lost forever because the waters were returning. So they had a choice. First, they went back and proclaimed it to the whole civilization. They were laughed at. They were rocked. They were ridiculed. They were run. They tried another attempt. They had tried to prove it through science, but the society had become so devalued in terms of his knowledge that it couldn't even understand what they were saying. He said, how do we prove this thing? The only thing they could do is to go to the boat school and say, with all due respect, professor, the way you build boats are incorrect. They will sink. Of course, the professor didn't want to hear this. I have an advanced degree in building boats. Who the hell are you? They said, we were in the water last night. They said, that's nonsense. What do you know about water? They realized that they were in a real position. So they decided, we're going to build our own institutions underground, and we're going to build boats correctly, and we're going to show people how to swim correctly, and we're going to show people how to farm on the water correctly, and we're going to indicate what really water really is because these people have forgotten the ways. And so eventually, two became four, four became eight, eight became 100. Eventually, there was such a sizable group that this civilization could not ignore them and say, who are these weird people in their approaches to building boats and fishing and holding their breath? And as this debate raised, the society grew. And as the society grew, the, the, eye, the skies began to open up and rain became more prevalent in the society. So much so that they found themselves, the majority of people found themselves swamped. They didn't know how to irrigate water. They didn't know how to swim in water. They didn't know how water would help their crops. And they were flowing. They, the, whole, the whole society was just in a muck. But luckily, the heroes came out. This group of people who believed and understood the science of water began to erect boats that actually float and began to build roofs that actually keep water out and began to actually harvest fish from the waters that flooded their village. And suddenly, they began to say, well, I'm getting a very much more rich quality of life. Eventually, through what we call the 100th monkey syndrome, generations became born understanding how to properly swim understanding how to properly build boats, understanding the value of the ocean, the civilization once again reached its pinnacle. 
And this is a parable I use because the, symbol, the symbolic use of water is symbolic to our use of the sacred plant medicine. There was a time in the ancients where all people knew about how to tap into higher dimensional realities to shape the waking reality. And this information was preserved in our greatest of scriptures. But over time and over ignorance and over environmental shifts, energetic shifts, polar shifts, where we are in a universe, this information became less relevant and became ridiculed in a such. But like all civilizations, there were those people who maintained these ancient teachings as best they could because they knew that one day this would be back online. And so when we talk about the society of knowers who preserve this understanding and this reverence for this deep knowledge, this is who you are. This is who we are. This is the work that we are about right now. And so the reason I'm here, big ups to Dave, big ups to the Oakland fam, the reason that we're here is because we're here to show people how to build boats correctly. How to utilize the energetics, the spiritual technology for the oncoming waters because there are shifts occurring. So this is the basis of walking the path of initiatory practice because this is the basis in which Baba originally approached me. Now, when he originally approached me, I hope I'm going the right way. Okay, this is me as a young man. I'm Justin Petty. That's my birth name, Baba Mudubaki. People say, well, what's your name? <laughs> what's your real name? I say, Mudubaki. <laughs> no, what's your... So just for clarity, I was given a name, and when I was initiated, I took a name. Okay? So for those who don't know, my name is Justin Petty. These are my wonderful parents here. And this is me absolutely terrified learning how to fish because the knowledge had been lost, right? So this is symbolic. But these are, this is my wonderful father. This is my wonderful mother and my brother, um, all of who are now ancestors. But they walk and talk with me every day. So just the orientation where I am, that's the famous Detroit River. All right, you see the wonderful small good old 70 style, right? All right. Now this is my teacher. Um, and I had the honor of being his student. And in many regards, through our travels and study, we became friends. And ultimately, super honored to any way be affiliated and to, to be able to share what he taught me. So I acknowledge the, the E family, his wife, to Marion Institute, because this is how I came up. I came up like a brash activist um, calling for revolutionary change in a black community. And my teacher, Baba Kalindi was very, very much in the movement. And what I mean in the movement, in the movement for human rights, women's rights, gardening, agriculture, all these things that are reviving the human spirit, he was the guy behind it. This was while he was doing his mushrooms, but he was a profile one of the world's highly ranked, most highly ranked martial artists. And so I came to him as a student of martial arts because I was ready for war. <laughs> or at least to protect my community's interests. But he realized, he, he emphasized to me, he said, the war is within. And so I trained with him as a young martial arts student for, for years. And he eventually, I came, I said, Baba, where am I at? He said, oh, keep training. That's what he always tell you, right, keep training. But he said, the ultimate battle was within. And so after years of training, he began to invite me. And this is a picture of one of the sessions. But every Sunday, I would show up and I'd be the one grinding rice for him, sitting about, fetching water, jars, not knowing what I was doing. But what he was doing was showing me the long form original PF tech to grow. And then once I mastered that, he said, now it's time for you to be initiated. And that's when I became affiliated with the mushroom because as a martial artist, he said, it's not about fighting physical bones. It's like the Bible said, we fight principalities. We're fighting energetic influences. And so I couldn't understand what he meant until, we, until I went in. And then he prompted me to go higher and higher. And he prompted my circle of peers in which I trained with to initiate themselves. Because most people in martial arts thinking it's about punching and kicking. But honestly, if you're a six foot two, athletically trained martial artist, yeah, you probably don't have many societal threats, right? So what's the use of training, right? For the protection and discipline within. So this is Baba Ahati Kalindi. This is an issue of one, of one of the sessions that we had, and him teaching in impromptu sessions. Another influence of my life was Czech Amadou Bamba Mbaki, which I get my last name from. Baba told me 
It was time for me to get initiated. So I went over to Senegal and I studied with the Sufic Mystic Brotherhood. If any people don't know about Cheikh Amadou Bamba, he was a revolutionary uh, hero of Senegal. He ran the French out without following, firing a single shot. This is after 17 attempts on his life in which the French realized they couldn't kill him. They, no, they couldn't kill him. And if you read the history, it was all kind of weird things going on, like the transport ship they were going to deport him on would sink, and the guards that were going to you know, take him would go delirious. You know, the handcuffs they put him on would just come apart. And this is a documented history. This is a, one of the last highly acknowledged spiritual gurus on this planet that would do, you know, bilocation and healing with touch and all of these things. Check, I'm a Dubamba. And after the expulsion of the French, he created this society called the Morite Brotherhood. And the Morite Brotherhood were a pacifist Islamic Sufi group. Islamic Sufis are Islamic mystics. Just like all religions, there are groups of mystics who study the deeper aspect of this reality. So I was named after his brother, Mudu Awambalambaki, and I take that very seriously. The name means he is worthy of praise. He who loves, like he'll die tomorrow, but he works as if he'll live forever. And so that was a very important part of my development. This is uh, where I received my name. This is the holy city of Tuba. Um, and these are similar images from the past. So if we look down here, this is part of our Temerian family. You know, uh, this is me. You see those eyeglasses? <laughs> that's me. And that's many of our Temerian family. Um, after one of our conferences, this is Brother Ken Moody. I know you can't see them. He's the current Grand Master. And it's a lot of other brilliant, uh, highly accomplished martial artists. But this is my home base in learning the science. This is based on traditional African martial arts, such as capoeira, which in African martial arts, spiritualism, the use of herbs, magic, sigils, spells, were kin and kith to kicking and punching. Um, and this is his philosophy. Martial arts aims to teach people how to live their life and not simply fighting techniques. Because if you study war and you study how vulnerable other people are, you understand how vulnerable you are. And the last thing you want is to engage in war unnecessarily. That's why a well-trained person is usually the most peaceful person. It's the person who's untrained <laughs> that you have to worry about because they have never meditated on the impact of violence. This is a uh, etch from the Beni Hassan statue and pyramids. This is the proof evidence that, you know, yes, Africans did martial arts 10, 20,000 years ago. Contrary to the belief, martial arts was shared by all people. But yeah, you see the same techniques. You see reverse throwing, you see swords, you see fights, you see hand-to-hand -hand archery, all of that. But they tell us, and they were taught me that martial arts came out of Asia. And so he was the first one to open my mind and say martial arts is a human expression. And it's deeper than just punching and kicking. This is his brother, Brother Jahid Nuri, who's also a highly recognized martial arts. You may have seen him in blood sport one, two, and three. I don't know, three, two. But he was in a lot of these martial arts movies. Very profound brother. He's still, you know, on the movie set. Uh, he is one of the top students of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the Gracie family. So he's one of the top grapplers in the nation right now. But this is part of our system. I'm just introducing our family and my influence in my life. OK. My initial influence and my initial orientation with the sacred plant medicine came through my understanding of how it was used in Kemet. And in Kemet, the sacred plant medicine was used as a, as a portal. It was used to shape reality. It was the original aspect of religion. It was the original communion. And from this, we get aspects of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. This is where the Holy Communion concept comes from. This is where the resurrection of the dead comes from. This is where the concept of life everlasting comes from. The concept of the Godhead being both plural and monotheistic at once. Okay, because in ancient Kemet, there was no one God. No, they were forces. And God, the Godhead was too complex to define with simple terminology or in one thing. So, in ancient Kemet, they understood this. Why is this important? Because all of us know, all of us who have been in that space, we encounter different energies that represent different aspects, that represent different 
parts of who we are or what the world represents. And so understanding that is key to understanding the sacred mushroom realm. Um, it's very hard to see, but these are some of the early mushroom glyphs that are found in Algeria, which indicates how human civilization developed from this initial experience with the mushroom, their understanding of the divine. And this represents traditional African religion. Why am, I, why am I featuring this? Because this is key, because all traditional aspects of spirituality look something like this. Now, through colonialism, a lot of this stuff was wiped out. And a lot of stuff is considered taboo and secret. But there are pockets of people who understand this knowledge. So when you're talking about healing, when you're talking about disease, when you're talking about spirit, there's communities who understand that healing is a dynamic process between the physical world and the spiritual world. There are people who understand that there's crack dealing or if there's murder and robbery in a community, it's not individuals that's sick, it's everybody that's sick. They didn't see the local robber as a robber. They saw them as an individual who had been mounting with the negative energy. And that energy will hop around the community. It may go next door, start a fight with the spouses. Then it may go across the street and start calamity. This is a different aspect in which in our society we blame the people. You stole. You are a bad person. Ancients realized, nope, there's some negativity that's floating around, and it can hit any of us at any time. None of us are immune from it. None of us are above it. And so as collectively, we have to deal with it. And so this is a traditional approach and how societies will protect their entire community, not just themselves. You know, oh, monotheistic God, look out for me to hell with everybody else. That's how we do it now, right? No, now it was, you know, Godhead protect us all from whatever energies, and it's not just one Godhead. So this is an ancient approach, and this is one of the ancient approaches to spirituality that have been lost, and this is one of the ancient approaches that we learn when you go into the high-dose realm. That's what we're talking about. Now, as Dave so eloquently explained, the high dose realm isn't something that you approach very casually. And it's not something for everyone. It's only for those that may or may not be committed to going into that realm because it's not fun and games. But when you go into that realm, you understand that we are not mere observers of the waking reality. We are shapers of the waking reality. We influence the waking reality. Now, the science of how to purposely do that has been lost, but it's being reemerged. These ancient traditional aspects mixed with the understanding of sacred plant medicine is where the power lies. In some societies, you have heavy plant use, but they don't have any knowledge of sacred tradition. You have other societies that have knowledge of sacred tradition, but they've lost knowledge of plant use or fungus use. And so this is a situation in which that society, once again, has forgotten how to build boats, right? So who are we? We are the ones that represent there is water. There is a way to build a boat properly. There are approaches to, to achieving higher energetic states, to shaping our reality, OK? So yes, this is a traditional re, uh, um, ceremony in which they are feeding the Igungun, or the ancestors. They are feeding the ancestors because they realize that we live in a dynamic world. So if I move on and I love my family, there's no way I'm going to leave them abandoned. And so they understand that the relationship between loved ones exists beyond the physical realm and that to maintain that relationship and to keep that healthy relationship, they must acknowledge the ancestors. This is why the Confederates will kill you for taking a statue down. This is where people get power from. This is something that we've been taught is taboo, though. Now, you can conjure good ancestors or bad ancestors, right? And so when we go into these higher states, we understand what we're going in for. We have to understand that we have to go in clean. You don't go into a sacred space like this if you're still dealing in mundane thoughts of jealousy. You know, she don't like me. She turned me down for the date or you know, my neighbor didn't wave at me, so I can't stand them. If you're dealing on such pedal elements, you will get devoured in that realm. What are we talking about? Um, the awakening of the Uraeus or the sacred serpent. 
And I'm going all over the place because I'm trying to encompass a lot of the energy and a lot of knowledge that I learned from Kalindi into high dose and how high dose applies. This is the Uraeus. This is the symbol, the serpent that we see at the head of the pharaohs or the mask, the death mask of the pharaohs. And the Uraeus represents, of course, as we all know, the spinal cord or the Kundalini. The Kundalini sitting at the base of the spine gets activated with DMT, which is why if any of us go on high doses, even moderate doses, seven plus grams, you'll notice a little gyration going on. You know, you notice that you want to dance and you, you feel an extra, you know. Why is that? Because the uraeus <laughs> becomes excited and there's a, on a physical level, there's a cerebral spinal fluid, CSF, and it begins to pump and it begins to feed the third ventricle of the brain. Now the third ventricle of brain looks like a cobra. And the third ventricle of the brain inside the third, or well, the sec two ventricles of the brain is a third ventricle. Within this third ventricle is what they call the cave of Brahma. The cave of Brahma has three mystical jewels in it. Thalamus, pineal, and pituitary. When the cerebral spinal fluids began to flood the, the cave, the mystical cave and the three jewels in the cave at high doses, what occurs is that the pineal gland helps to regulate your spiritual understanding. Pituitary gland, of course, deals with your physical growth, but the thalamus is split into two. And this is what you call the optic nerve of the brain or the so-called third eye. So when you flood this cave of Adullam, what you're doing is you're attuning your physical understanding with your spiritual understanding with your sight. Now this is bio-spiritual, in other words, you can it can be verified in science. And if you, any student of the ancient yogis, they'll verify it too. This is when you bridge those two knowledge together and you understand what's going on in these higher dose realms. Now, when you bathe these three jewels in the cerebral spinal fluid, it occurs rapid growth, physically, spiritually, and sight-wise. This is why you have to be prepared if you're going on this path because now you're about to start making fundamental changes, not only in yourself, but the people around you. This is the sacred uraeus. This is some of the secrets that we were taught. Secret, oh, secretion, oh, sacred, oh, sacral. Oh, you see, it's all connected, sacral, secreting. <laughs> this is the, what they call the uh, Kabaka stone. This is one of the most sacred relics that you'll find in Kemet. No, it's not later than gold. No, it doesn't have diamonds. Why is it important? Because it's one of the most ancient relics found in Kemet. And what it does, if you, people who studied it, it is the oldest representation of particle physics and, the, and, and description of the Big Bang creation of the universe known to any human. It's called the Shabaka Stone. This was the basis of modern science. This is the basis of early Greek philosophy, which I say is a misnomer because I wish they would have gave Socrates and Plato the platform they deserve. But the reality of the matter is philosophy was considered an illegal crime in ancient Greece. And so these students of Kemet, Socrates, Plato and them who went to Egypt to learn these higher sciences passed the first degree. They returned to Greece and they were stoned and killed and castigated. So imagine our understanding of physical science based on these ancient Greek thinkers if they were allowed to study their full course in Kemet. But the fear, the, what we call the pharmacoidic inquisition occurred. And this is when the philosophers began to get murdered off and these ancient teachings began to get buried because you had the Roman Empire. Who the hell needs Greeks? And the Romans would take over the Kemet, right? And they got gold and we just, take everything and we bury it until about 711 AD when, when, when there was a, the Moorish conquest of Europe and they established the library of Alhambra. And the library of Alhambra, some of the early scholars of Europe studied, went to that library and this is where you find the early descriptions of things like gravity, how the human body works. This is the basis of the Renaissance. What am I saying? I'm saying that throughout history, there was a place in which this knowledge was well established and understood, in which it was suppressed, in which it came back, in which it was suppressed, in which it came back, in which it was suppressed. And guess where we at now? It's coming back. The question is, how do we keep it from getting repressed, right? Well, the secret is we have to war against ignorance, right? 
So this is the Kabaka stone. Why is that related? Well, the ancients had an understanding. This is where it gets a little deep. So hang with me, y'all, because our reality doesn't exist on simply this planet. Me and Hati had the pleasure of traveling around Africa and talking with many different tribes. And I'll guarantee you this. There's not many tribes, major tribes in Africa whose name doesn't mean we're not from, the, we're not from Earth. Just about every major African tribe says we're not, we're not earthlings. That's what their names mean. We're off the planet. We're Zulu, we're children of the stars. None of them say we're from the planet. These ancients tell us that, no, 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 no. This is just one of many places in which we existed. And so in the ancient teachings, you'll find constant recognition, depending on what we know. We call Orion which is the Greek interpretation, but Orion's belt, we talk about the Sirius. The ancients talked about the Draco star system. Dracula! They talked about uh, Ursa Major, Ursa Minor. They talk about Sirius, the dog star. This is where you get the whole mythology, vampires versus werewolves. The ancients talked about the earth being seeded with many types of different beings. Not all of them coming from the same place. Not all of us, not any of us coming from Earth itself. In fact, we being cosmic beings who are seeded through this universe, through spores, just like mushrooms are. This is why you go amongst the Dogo, they say, no, our ancestors come from us, from Sirius, every 60 years. This is why the Dogo people in North Africa can describe the rotation of the planet, what it's made of, how much it weighs. And they say, that's where we come from. We're not from Earth. Why am I saying this? It's because when we go into these high doses, many of us say, I see aliens. I see spirits. I see other situations and entities. Yes, you do. Ahati taught me, please get out of your mindset that you are just stuck on Earth. Stop thinking that the destiny of human is just on Earth and that the past of humans was just on Earth. I know it gets a little spooky. But this is what this ancient mushroom teaches us, that our lineage extends beyond earth and that our reality extends beyond physical life. This is the teaching of all the scriptures. But just like that parable I said, so much of it has gotten frayed and faded that we just don't understand. Ain't no death. Ain't, come on. So anyway, um, this is why it's so important that we understand stars. Because just like birds, all of us have magnetic and big ups. If y'all don't have them, go get some low stones from back there. Uh, we all have magnetic particles in our brain that orient us toward north naturally. Okay? Just like birds and every biological animal. And we are oriented toward north because that is the magnetic center of our planet. But deeper than that, we are all oriented toward another orientation. What? The sun. The sun is an orientation that all animals tend to orient. This is why you have your pineal gland and knows when it's time to wake up because it's oriented to the sun. So physically, we orient it to aspects of the cosmos and it regulates how we experience reality, right? But there's another orientation we have that the, was lost. Our greatest orientation through the pendulum of time comes with this. Does anybody recognize that? This is a beautiful image, and it took 90 years to produce this and 180 countries. This is the event horizon. This required just about every nation, or not 180 countries, excuse me, but it required every scientifically advanced country to commit to sending satellites in space and to take a picture of the black hole from different angles, and then coming together, compiling thousands of images over 20 years, and coming up with this image. And this is the image of what we call an event horizon. And so in the long form of history, I'm not talking about the human life. I'm not talking about the civilization. I'm talking the long form of history. Our ancestors understood that our planet is going through a change. And this change that is coming is called the event horizon. The event horizon is the nearest black hole. And what scientists have observed is that on the other side of the event horizon, everything is the opposite and that everything disappears, even knowledge disappears through that event horizon. And guess what? 86% of our universe is already on the other side. So we like the last few grains of whatever at the bottom of the sink, 
eventually going through this event horizon. This is the long form of why we develop and what we are about and who we are and why we're here. Sometimes we're laden with questions of why do we exist? Why are humans here? Da -da 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 -da. What's the ultimate thing? We are on a long cosmic journey. We have been on a long cosmic journey. Our orientation with time, this is why we get upset at the past, because you were there. This is why you get excited for the future, because you will be there. But the most powerful point is being ever present, because that's all there really is, is just a consistent present. Past is an illusion, future is an illusion, there's just the constant present. And when the constant present, that's when you understand the science of immortality. Because there just is now. There is no what happened yesterday. There's just now. And this event horizon of our cosmic is just like the event horizon of our physical body. It's just now. There is no. You're just constantly moving forward in time. And so the illusion of death, the illusion of limit, the illusion of structure is the illusion of this part of the universe. And it's time to break through that. Now, I know it's a little mystical and things like that, but what destroys our society more than anything is the concept of scarcity and lack. This is what drives warfare. This is what drives greed and everything else. But we know that scarcity and lack is a myth that's created in our minds. And so the purpose of these high dose trips is one, when we were going in and what others go in is to first discover these mysteries of the universe. And in these discoveries, we were learning, and many of us who've been learned that the universe is full of what? Anything we want. When you go into this space, the first thing these sacred fungus says, you can have whatever you like. There is no end. And that's the gospel. But we have to what? Do the hundredth monkey syndrome. The hundredth monkey syndrome, just like occurred with the Japanese scientists observing the monkeys on the beach that would eat the the potatoes, and they would spend all day brushing the sand off the potato, trying to get it clean to eat it. The younger generation came up, started throwing the potatoes in the salt water. It washed the salt off, and it made it tastier. They brought it back to the elders. The elders said, go with that nonsense. This is the traditional way. But this generation kept doing it to the event that not only were they healthier, stronger, because they were eating more faster, that the next generation after them they came out the womb knowing how to throw potatoes in the water. And that's what we are here for, to achieve that 100th monkey syndrome. So that one day humanity will, concepts of scarcity and lack, death and fear, will eventually fade away. But that has to be done in a collective sense. Individuals are cool, but the collective consciousness has to be done. And so when we talk about brothers like Dave who do this work, or well, all of us in this room that do this work, this is why it's so important that I say I am a mycologist, a mycophile, I am not a dealer. Because this work that we are part of is so profound. This is civilizational. And it could change the way that we see the world for future generations. Thought produces matter. We have to understand that. Thought produces matter. Matter doesn't produce thought as we've been taught. Thought produces matter. Why? Well, if you think of a pencil, how long did it take to think to invent a pencil? Like somebody had to say, I need something to write with. Then they said, well, I need something to mark with. And then they found something to mark with, but it would get all over their hands. Then they said, I need a way to take this thing that I would mark with without it getting on my hands. And then they would do it, but it would break. Then they said, I need a way to have this thing that makes marks do it, put it in my hand, it wouldn't make must and break. In other words, you could see the levels of sophisticated that, that it required to create something as simple as a pencil. A pencil probably represents about three million thoughts. And so when we look around our room, every physical thing is a production of thought, concentrated human thought. First starting as an idea, then starting as an inspiration, then starting as a concept, theory, prototype, you know, and manifesting to the physical world. And so when we go into this higher space, that's also what we're doing is we're seeding our waking reality with thoughts, and this is why ancients would have secret societies, because you can't let any fool go in there and see the reality um, who don't have the proper understanding of why we're doing what we're doing. And this is why secret societies existed, why it was always an oath and I was always held top secret, because it is important. 
my last slide before I end because I, I really enjoy it. There's so much I want to share. I can just brrr. But this is a, a symbol that represents the non-locality of consciousness. Our consciousness is not within our brain. It's not within our head. Our consciousness is wherever we direct it. Our consciousness is that chair when you look at it hard enough. Our consciousness is that car when you see it about to go into accident. You say, ooh, because you feel the impact of the car. So controlling of your conscious and your focus or your thought is key. And so I'm going to end with this. But this is something that Baba taught me, and this is what we're about. Those of us who are willing to be masters of the mind and manifest a greater reality must have a discipline to master our thoughts. Because those thoughts are lack, scarcity, negativity, fear, doubt. We're seeding reality. So as we explore this ancient, traditional, futuristic technology, uh, let's embrace it with purpose and not simply pursuing the bag. Let's understand that, yes, we can achieve a greater reality, a greater lifestyle, but at the same time, we could change the world and those people around us. And so with that, I'm going to end. But I'd like to thank y'all for, for sharing with me and giving me audience. I could be reached at Moodle Baki on Facebook or Moodle Baki on Instagram. I'm pretty basic. Thank you very much. <laughs>